Pardon the interruption, I'm Chris Garrett, joined by Sam Mulberry. And Chris, uh, we are on the eve of exam number one. Ah, first exam. That's yeah. right. My so, favorite holiday in early uh, what should we know about exam one? We've talked about it a little bit, but what should we know yeah, about Yeah, we'll this? give you some more advice in just a second. We'll do some more review. But just kind of let's talk about the structure of the exam, how it works. First of all, it's 100 points. You'll do three of these. Each one is basically a unit exam. Once we get into unit two and three, you'll note that we'll kind of carry over some vocab, so you'll do a little review. But basically, it's a unit test, so 100 points. Um, a lot of it should be pretty quick, so it'll be just kind of matching questions like here are 10 descriptions of any vocab, recognition or mastery, you just got to match it up. There'll be a map, there'll be a timeline, a couple of date questions you have to know. Um, where you'll have to write some would be about mastery terms and how they might connect to each other. Um, you don't, uh, you have to identify quotations from the reading packets, we might talk about that. Uh, and then we'll talk about the essay in just a second because that's the biggest part, that's 30 points. Um, because it's an open book, open note test, you're on your own, you're, we're kind of trusting you to behave with integrity here and to do this on your own with those resources available. The one restriction we give is that you've got to start the test between 3 and 7 o'clock Central Daylight Time on the day of each test. Now, I know sometimes that presents a problem if you've got like a work schedule where you're just not there from 3 to 7, that's where you need to talk to your section leader um, in advance. Uh, it's Monday, so hopefully yes. you've already done that because you've got to set that up in advance per the syllabus. Um, did it with uh, disability accommodation. Those should all be set up. Yep, so I think those are all set up. So, past that, Sam, I think in some ways the hardest part of this, and the one that uh, um, is hardest to predict is the essay. Mm -hmm. So we don't actually give you the essay in advance, but it is 30 points. What, what's your advice about how to prepare for and then write the <clears throat> exam essays? Uh, my advice is a lot of this test is time management. When I've, as I've taught this course online over the years, the big problem people have with exam one is they wait to do the, ex the essay last, which is fine, but they run out of time. Yeah, and, and they have 75 minutes, I right. said. Yep. Once that three to seven window starts, the clock just goes. Yep. yep. So um, so they, they run out of time and they end up having to kind of bullet point or just throw things down and that essay score is not what it should be right. if, they, if they gave themselves time. So one piece of advice would be write the essay first. Yep. Or at least read the essay question first so you know what it is I need to do and make sure even maybe even set a timer for yourself mm -hmm. to say like okay I'm gonna if I have 75 minutes I want to use 25 minutes on the essay so I'm gonna set a timer for 50 minutes I'm gonna do everything I can in 50 minutes except the essay and then hope, presumably you should be starting the essay before then anyhow I mean you should 50 minutes should be plenty of time to do the rest but if that timer goes off and you haven't started it yet, you need to get because that's the it's the biggest percentage yeah. of your test. Yeah, it's thirty percent of the test, and honestly, a lot of the rest of it should not actually take that long. Right. I mean, you kind of either know it or you don't. The biggest yep. problem is if you think, "Oh, I'll just look up all those quotations in the reading packet," and you're wasting time searching exactly. the PDF because <laughs> you haven't been doing the readings. Uh, that's where it's going to take time. You're going to get hit on the essay. Yep. So the other thing to look for, and then when you're actually writing the essay, is make sure, kind of like with the with the essays we've been writing, make sure you look at everything the question question is asking mm -hmm. because one of the things we're going to look for as we grade those is kind of are you addressing every part of the question mm -hmm. uh, and then w just like with the other essays there's a difference between a correct answer and a complete answer so uh, an essay that's going to be an A answer is going to draw on readings, the films, things like that. It's going to specific details. Yeah, yep. So so you can talk in generalities and be generally correct, mm -hmm. but to have a complete answer, it's going to be drawing on those things. Yeah, and if that sounds utterly terrifying <laughs> right now, let me, re now, let's reassure you. Uh, we don't give you the question, but we do give you these kind of essay themes in the study guide. We're obviously, we're going to pick one of those themes, or maybe we'll combine two of them. If you're familiar with those themes, have been thinking about them, you'll be fine. The other thing is, like, this is all interconnected. It's mm -hmm. not like the essay covers, you know, 30 percent of vocab that I mean that is completely disconnected from the rest. I would say like whether it's face-to-face, -face, online, hybrid, my basic advice is if you know the mastery terms backwards and forwards, you'll be in good shape. Mm -hmm. Because those show up in a lot of different ways on the test and then most likely at least two or three of those would be really important to whatever essay you're going to have to write about. And so, you know, as you're doing some last review, look through those themes, maybe think about where would you plug in some mastery mm -hmm. terms to each of those possible essays. And often those mastery terms are also connected to readings That's specifically as well. Chris, in, in our last uh, museum assignment, we talked about 
sort of different debates or controversies facing the early church. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that to me that's always a really interesting question because we think of those things as things that kind of are in the past and the church had to wrestle with them and they resolve these questions. But as we think about ourselves in the 21st century, as you look at some of those debates about canon, doctrine, things like that, what are the things that sort of still, you think still kind of rumble around in the church or still have significance to the church today? Yeah, I, so one I think about a lot is the Council of Nicaea. Right? Obviously we talked a lot about that. That's a big term for you to know. Um, and we probably don't think about those very specific Christological issues too much. I mean, it seems like a very small, very nuanced thing. What's the difference between similar substance to God and same substance? What's the difference between uh, begotten, not made, and made, mm -hmm. right? It, like, because uh, Arius, you know, is trying to read scripture, and there are some passages that suggest there's kind of a ranking and that Jesus is created, but that doesn't fit with, say, John chapter 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, so it can seem like it doesn't matter much. It matters a ton, though, because if we get this wrong, we are getting worship wrong, we're getting Jesus wrong, we're getting God wrong. I mean, I'm the kind of Christian, you'll, you'll hear more about this as we get to, like, the Reformation, and we'll talk about pietism. I, I'm the kind of Christian who generally says we ought to strive much harder for unity. And we probably divide over many small things we don't need to divide about. But if you pressed me, uh, this is something I'd say we need to divide about. We have to get Christ right. And I think the Council of Nicaea is the church's best attempt to get Christ right. Now, I don't know about you, Sam, I do struggle with the fact that the way this works out is the Roman emperor calls a right. bunch of bishops together who vote. And then, uh, often violently and coercively, they get rid of the heretics. Yeah, and when so I that, when I, that rubs me a little wrong. <laughs> right, and when I teach this in, in class, when students like I, I present that as an issue, like, I mean, Constantine doesn't have an official role in the church, but he's calling a church council. Mm -hmm. That's not his job. So, I, and, but I present this in multiple ways. You can look at that and say, isn't that a problem? That the foundation for most of Christian theology comes about through this political machinations, oh, right? Yeah. Or mm -hmm. you can say mm -hmm. that's actually the miracle. The miracle is that despite of the despite the fact that there were all these different motivations to get this question resolved, that the truth sort of rung through. I, I think that is one of the. I mean, that's the miracle of the church, right? <laughs> that the church, over time, becomes this increasingly politicized institution. That's like every institution concerned with self-preservation. It's making compromised choices. It sometimes punishes the wrong people. And yet the Holy Spirit still works through it, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, Jesus. I mean, like, that that's a miracle that we should wrestle with throughout this course. Um, now, at the same time, Sam, I do remember a student once asked me, do we just believe that about Christ because this council said so? And it points to a larger question, which is, should we give a kind of special standing to the early church? Because I'd say, whatever Christian tradition you come from, you probably do kind of say there's something special about it. Like Protestants in the Reformation think that what they're doing is going back in time to recover the early church. And Anabaptists are even going to go back before Constantine to recover a pacifist, nonviolent, non-resisting church. Um, if you're Catholic or Orthodox, there's a sense of you stand in an apostolic line that goes back to Peter, or the Orthodox would say they're really the early church unchanged. Right. Is that appropriate? Do we give too much importance to these first couple centuries of Christianity? It probably is appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's why, I, one way to think about it is sort of the, the con you're familiar with the concept of entropy, right? That yes. things sort of fall apart over time. So if you look to the early- it's as much physics. As right. It, yeah, if you look towards the, the early church, right, that is the closest to the life of Christ. It's the closest, if you think about apostolic succession, mm -hmm. I mean, if you're looking at the Christians living in the 100, the second or third century, those are people who can trace their intellectual bloodlines back mm -hmm. not that far, and all of a sudden you're talking about Peter and Paul and Christ. Like, like, like it, it's not that big of a, you know, it's, it's sort of thinking about, you know, how far removed are we from the founders of the United States, right? I mean, we're, it's about that distance, right? And, it, and America feels like a pretty young country, right? So, so I think that that early church has that, that to that degree, it is, it is really more closely tied. Plus, you have, you know, 2,000 years of debates yeah. that, 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 are, that the church that we live in is so shaped by. Um, so those debates haven't sprung up yet. Mm -hmm. Some of the issues that we face now wouldn't have been issues mm -hmm. or couldn't have been issues then. So there is a kind of a sense of purity. The thing that, question that I think is always interesting too has to do with like how do we wrestle with revelation and things yeah. like that. You know, and I think Erasmus talks about this, like, you know, biblical scholars have to wrestle with, well, why was it that 
the authors of, of the scripture in the first, second century, they have this sort of ability to write inerrant scripture but then now we can't get, we can't get revelation like that anymore i think that's always an interesting question yeah i mean in modern churches uh, like so uh let me talk about mormonism because that's a christian group that does not accept the council of nicaea treats father and son as two separate beings i mean the mormons think that they have received new revelation in the 19th century and continuing that's still a part of mormonism and so why don't other christians believe that i mean i think there are a lot i basically would say the same thing as you there's something about the early church especially that kind of second century you know the apostolic fathers people like polycarp they're literally the disciples of disciples right. in some cases um, that makes me feel like they probably are the closest to christ in some way but at the same time i'd also want to draw a line around constantine Right? Like, is it still the early church once it's an imperial church? Um, I mean, this is the Anabaptist kind of argument mm -hmm. we'll get to in Unit 2, that there is something, I mean, they almost think there, there was a second fall. The church gave in to the temptations of political power and violence. And you heard that a little bit in the documentary, right? The, the church goes from being persecuted to being the persecutors uh, in the medieval museum. Well, the whole section about heretics who are burned at the stake by the church. Um, but also that makes me admire someone like Augustine, right? Mm -hmm. Who then, you know, a little bit more removed is still trying to wrestle with these questions in light of a church that now inescapably is institutional, powerful, and tied with civilization that's falling apart, mm -hmm. right? And so that's why. Well, that's why I look at Anthony and the Desert, Desert Fathers and in, 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 Fathers and Mothers in a similar kind of way to, to recognize in the moment something's changed and how are we gonna, how do we feel about that? How do we wrestle with that? Chris, um, you just talked about Augustine. Um, we have a, a big national holiday uh, coming Canada up, Day. right? That's right. Well, we talked a lot about Canada. Yes. Uh, July 4th, right? Uh, this is this, uh, you know, we talked in the, in the early, or in the ancient world about kind of civic religion and, you know, uh, things like that. Uh, how would Augustine think about this sort of his notion of church and state? What do you think he would have to say about American Christians in the 4th of July? Yeah, Augustine is very subtle on this. And I feel like this is one of the most important, his City of God reading is what we're going to talk about here. Uh, it's one of the most important readings in the reading packet, and it's one of the hardest to understand. So I think the very first thing you want to say is, whatever you're going to do on 4th of July, remember, Christian, your citizenship is in heaven. <laughs> Like you, this is not fully your citizenship. And so whatever you're doing, don't get too deeply attached to it, right? So that, that's, as long as you always keep that in mind, you're probably not gonna go too far wrong. But at the same time, I think he would say it's okay for you to be patriotic. I mean, he has this kind of notion of uh, the love of God does not exclude other loves, right? So he talks about family, he talks about wisdom and truth, um, and he talks about country. The love of the Roman patria, patriotism, as long as it's below the love of God and not contradictory to the love of God and of neighbor, you know, that that's actually appropriate. And as long as you don't start to equate them, I think right. is a part of it, is a yeah. big piece of it too, which which sometimes we historically we have stumbled to. into, right? Yeah, and the, this is the problem. Like on the very first, I think it was the first museum on the ancient world, uh, one of the questions we asked is, what are ancient virtues Christians should reject? And not surprisingly, a lot of you wrote about ancient religion. And you talked about, well, of course we can have multiple gods, but understand like in ancient religion, the state is almost like a god, whether it's the Greeks or the Romans mm -hmm. or anyone else. That's something you have to be careful of. And, and civil religion, no matter who the president or congressperson or governor is, is tempting you to think that America is a kind of idol, right? And I think Augustine would warn against that as well. So it's this kind of both hand, right? It's like, okay, you're, you're a citizen of heaven, but you're also still a citizen of this country. And you can love this country and seek its good as long as you remember it's not God and it's imperfect and flawed. So one person I thought a lot about that I mentioned in the last episode is Frederick Douglass. I've been reading his biography by David Blight, who's a historian at Yale. And one of the ideas that Blight talks about is Douglass really wrestles with patriotism. You know, as, as an abolitionist, uh, he preaches this famous 4th of July, 5th of July sermon saying, you know, basically if you're a slave, this is not your country, it's rejected you. And, and it's this prophetic kind of condemnation of America. But in the Civil War itself, he preaches other kinds of sermons talking about how now it's our turn to become Americans and you have to let us fight for this country. And Bly calls it honest patriotism, which is you love the country so much you want it to be better. And so I maybe encourage you to think about that, right? I mean, like, love your country, but also think about how it falls short. I mean, how it is not the kingdom of God and maybe doesn't measure up and needs to be changed. It's also a great day to just reread the City of God reading. That's also good. <laughs> um, and, you know, grill and enjoy. That's right. That's, that's fine, too. Okay, we'll be right back to do some exam review in which Amy and Sam are going to play a little game that we like to call Food Chain.
Welcome back to segment two. Today we're going to play a game that we call Food Chain. This is my favorite game. Yes, yeah, so we are going to look at who the most significant figures from Unit 1 are. Amy, you have a list of your top I do. five. I have my top I five. I worked on it all night. We're going to kind of make our case for why we think these folks are significant, and then you guys get to vote on which list you think is best. Should yes. we get started? Yes, we shall. All right, I will kick us ahead. off. At number five, I have the philosopher Aristotle. Now, the reason that I have Aristotle uh, as my number five is because you're going to see my list is philosopher heavy. I think okay. I, it's it's kind of ideas y. Philosopher heavy list. Yeah, that could be a problem. It Did could you be a good say thing. It's ideas y. It's ideas y. Okay. <laughs> We're going to go with that. Okay. Um, but I think Aristotle's so significant in terms of shaping the way that we think about science. I mean, he is the last word in science okay. up until the scientific revolution. Um, I also think his counter to Plato's philosophy creates a tension in Western philosophy that is really essential, right? Uh, Plato talking about, you know, thinking about kind of pure, the realm of pure idea where Aristotle is thinking more empirically, more scientifically, and I think the Western mind exists in that tension. So I'm gonna put Aristotle number five on All my right, list. All right, sounds good. All right, well, I'm gonna get there, not as philosopher heavy as you, but um, for my position here, I'm gonna start with Homer. So I always like Homer. He's always the first person on the timeline. It's always a fun little thing. But Homer, um, is he like genre breaking? No, he's genre building. Um, there is no genre, right? And so Homer's writings, the Iliad and the Odyssey, stand out as these examples of the ways in which um, ideas put into writing then go on to shape an entire culture. So when we think about Greek culture, if we're going to think about, say, Aristotle, if we're going to think about ph philosophy, the development of, ph um, of philosophy, when we're going to uh, thinking about Alexander the Great, what does it mean to be someone of virtue? What does it mean to be a Greek citizen? Um, what are the virtues that um, that are uh, exemplified? Some of these things we mentioned last week, but we think about what does it mean to be courageous? What does it mean to be, um, uh, what does it mean to be loyal? These things all stem from the Iliad and the Odyssey. So thinking about the ways in which this teaches us that we can look at these texts um, and they teach us about Greek culture, even though they obviously predate. I mean, it's like, this is what, Greek culture gets patterned after. So I'm going to go with my man, Homer. I love that you put Homer on there. He's one of my favorite terms. He actually didn't make my list, and I'm oh, regretting it hearing you say that. That shocks yeah, me. Yeah, because he, he's one of my favorites, and I, I so I'm, I'm really thrilled that he's up on okay. this board. Mm -hmm. uh, for my number four person, I am putting it's Anthony. Okay, blown, right? I am. I'm so like, the, where are we going? And and I, I again, my list functions in a particular kind of way. It's about these sort of tensions. So um, right. Anthony exists in tension with the post-Constantinian church. So I thought about, okay. do I put Constantine on there or do I put Anthony on there as a representative of Christians who are wrestling with this change that happens? Um, and I also think the as we'll see going forward in this course the role of monasticism it will take many different forms but it becomes so central to christianity and while he's not exactly the first desert father he really is we can think of him as the father of western monasticism or the father of monasticism um, and that's going to shape uh, so much of what we're going to look at in the western church so I, I i wanted to get anthony there kind of as my representative of that Constantinian shift that happens in I the church. I am so interested. You have this, like, there's your list is thematic. I think that's <laughs> They talk fabulous. to each other. Yeah. Okay. Now I have to think on the fly of what's going on with my list. Like, everyone on my list has legs. <laughs> so well, you're getting ideas -y, I am getting, <laughs> was going to get ideas -y in here. So, yes, I'm getting ideas -y. I'm going to choose Plato. So I've just got to go with, look, if I'm going to sit there and make the case <laughs> last week that um, Plato is the more significant of these philosophers, then... I better put my money where my mouth is. And so, no, but it, but but also in terms of when we think about fig figures from Unit 1, for me what always kind of stands out is who are we going to come back to? Because some of the people that we've learned about, they're important and they matter. And then we're going to go away from them. But there are also these people and their ideas or what they represent from Unit 1 that like really become anchors in the course, that we're going to continuously come back to them. And Plato is certainly one of those. So Plato is uh, the, these questions about pursuing the ideal forms of thinking beyond these things that Aristotle is going to build on and challenge which is great and very much needed. But again, like the way that Plato is going to think even about like our spiritual selves versus our um, 
versus our fleshly nature, even though he is not a Christian and predates Christianity, he's going to have a significant um, influence on Christian thinkers. Um, and I mean, I would argue that like, you know, even as we are Christians today and gives us the language for that and the ways in which we think about truth and how do we, how do we distinguish truth? So I got to have Plato on there. I'm loving you know, your list so far. There's no Aristotle without Plato. That's right. Yep. Uh, number three on my list is Perpetua. Oh. Now again, this is this hmm. is kind of working. Kind of heavy here. Kind of right. working uh, with Anth working with Anthony, where where Anthony represents this post Constantinian church okay. and the tensions yes. of you know how do we wrestle with this? Perpetua represents Christian martyrdom. So and stepping I think, back, stepping back. Yep, I think this is one of the most significant things that shapes the early church after probably the apostolic period. I mean, you have Christ in the, in the apostles. Yeah. The next big thing that shapes the church is persecution. And as Christians living in that tension of persecution, I also like Perpetua because where we could look at Aristotle as this name which echoes through time, we could look at Anthony as this, even in the century where he's alive, he is a very famous person, right? Perpetua more represents the common Christian. Uh, to, to a much greater degree. I mean, this is probably a person you haven't heard of until you took this course. There's a chance you might not have remembered them, but you've heard of some of these other folks, yes. right? So, but I, but I do think that that persecution and martyrdom, I mean, the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. I think that this marks church growth in that early church period. In the, in the, the first segment, Chris and I talked about the significance of the early church as a um, as a kind of touchstone for the rest of Christianity. So she's there to represent that. Kind like of where you're headed with the significance of the early church. And there would be no early church if it were not for the Apostle Paul. Wow, and your you, list is real good. It's real good. It's real good. Do you think there's like post, did people have posters of Anthony like on their walls? Was it like? In the fourth century. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. No, that's what Augustine saying. did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. For yeah. sure. Um, no, but I chose the Apostle Paul. What, what I actually would kind of love would be to say, okay, gang, what can you tell me about the Roman Empire and life? lived in the Roman Empire through Paul. And we would get all of these interesting things because we know that Paul is able to travel freely throughout the Roman Empire. He's a citizen of the Roman Empire. Um, Paul wasn't a, like, I mean, Paul uh, was um, a, a Jew who had become a Christian. And so we know that Paul obviously had like this religious freedom that had existed. Um, we know that Paul, because of this ability to travel throughout the Roman Empire, we know that it's relatively navigable. I mean, people are sort of all over the Mediterranean. Paul is able to take the Christian message and he is able to travel to different places and to um, start churches or support churches that have been started all throughout the Mediterranean world. So we would have no Anthony without Paul because we wouldn't have Christianity um, taking root and really growing and thriving in North Africa. And to me, that's actually one of the most interesting things is the ways in which North Africa like it, it, so much of our story is um, the way, like North Africa as the home of Christianity, how it's um, kind of the center of it. Um, again, like with the early church here, um, at at you know at the end of Paul's life, things are starting to shift and change a bit because of the threat that Christianity is starting um, to play to the Roman Empire. Not necessarily a threat because of like. Um, militaristic types of, of implications, but like this is taking hold, this is growing, but um, we have our friend Paul to thank for that. He also wrote like half of the New Testament. He did. So he's oh, got that going right? for him too. That's yeah. significant. So he seems pretty Good important. Mm. Uh, so speaking of North African Christianity, I have my third oh, North okay. African Christian here. Um, Augustine. Or Augustine. Mm -hmm. uh, or Augustine is the... <laughs> Okay. is the perhaps the, the most significant Christian theologian. I mean, if I don't even know if we want to call Paul a theologian or, or what. I don't know how we think about the work that he does. He's the most significant figure in Christian theology since the Apostle yes, Paul. Yes, yes. Um, he is, of as a non-biblical writer, so I'll, I'll, right, I'll couch yeah. it that way. He shapes. I don't think you are a theologian if you're. That's a very interesting question. We'll have to ask a theologian that. We will. Because we, will. <laughs> we are not that. 1 800, call a theologian. <laughs> so Augustine is this foundational figure to the medieval church, right? So he's, he's here to launch us, to both understand the ancient world and to launch us into yes. Unit 2. The, the Christianity of the medieval church is going to be largely Augustinian, deeply, deeply impacted by him. At the same time, when you get to the Reformation, you know, this big divide that happens in the church, you can look at the Reformation as a debate about who's understanding Augustine yes. and the right parts yeah. of Augustine. Because Luther is super Augustinian yep. and the Roman church is super Augustinian. So I think he's he's this figure who takes all this stuff that we've been talking about in Unit 1 
and kind of pulls it all together and, and infuses Christianity with the ancient world in a particular kind of way. Now, you can view that as problematic, and some theologians do, but I think he is just a monumental figure. Unit one sandwich maker. That's right. He's made a unit one <laughs> kind sandwich. Kind of a panini of sorts. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Well, um, I think one of the most, someone we cannot, any good list, I mean, maybe you've got it, any good list, would have to have um, Emperor Constantine. And so we had sort of left off here with our story of the persecuted church. Um, and Christian pers persecution does continue to grow. It doesn't, it isn't kind of going anywhere. And then what happens is that we have this interesting conversion story um, in the figure of Emperor Constantine. Now, we can set aside, was he actually a Christian? Did he, you know, like, was it for political gains, this, that, or otherwise? But what Constantine does is significant because he fuses together, essentially, this Christian faith with um, the empire. So he does not legalize Christianity. I always think that's an important thing to point out. But what he does do is he says, like, we're going to, I'm sorry. He, he doesn't. doesn't he, I'm sorry. Right. Yes? Okay, here's what I was trying to say. He does not make it like the state religion. You don't have to be Christian. You're not going to get persecuted if you're not Christian. But he does legalize Christianity. And what that means is you cannot be persecuted if you are. So it puts an end to the persecution. And that means the church is just going to continue and grow. Now, again, when we think about significant, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're choosing good. Like, oh, here's the great. You know, it's 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 a tension here again. So I guess maybe mine has tensions as well. Yeah. Um, but this is a good and a bad thing because the church is able to thrive and grow. Um, the church is able to expand. Certainly far more people start to become Christians, but the church sort of loses some of the integrity and the, and the, the um, sort of purity of spirit that existed in the early church because now people are becoming Christian for political purposes. Um, the church is imbued with power, both again, like an actual political power, an economic type of power. And so we start to see Christianity look and become something quite different. Like, is this still the religion of like slaves, orphans, women, you know, the poor? Mm. Like and, and Constantine is this figure that we will, again, continue to wrestle with as we move forward. So for saying, what is the relationship between religion and state? Like, do we, do we have to have religious leaders? Um, how, how much should they put what they believe from a religious perspective into ruling, ruling a state? That was a I great, mean, that's an important question. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that was a great job to think about significance because you just made the case that after Constantine, the world is fundamentally different. It is. That means he's important. He and he's important. really good to have on the yep. list. Not on my list. But uh, oh. these two kind of represent Yes, yes. That, You've that, got, that we, we're yep. in the era here. Yep. We're all, so my yeah, number one, we're all dining at the same restaurant. That's right. My number one is your number four. Oh. And that is Plato. Because okay, if you're going to be ideasy, you're gonna, you yeah, got to go are, with the big idea guy at the top, be right? Ideas. And I think I think Plato is. I mean, he's he's one of my favorite philosophers. Um, I think he's he so much shapes. I mean, you you've really already made the case, right? He so much shapes philosophy going forward um, that every philosopher going forward needs to wrestle with Plato, needs to wrestle with Aristotle. Now, why I put Plato on top and Aristotle on the bottom here is because. Aristotle's reputation is damaged to a degree by the scientific revolution, right? Because Aristotle is a scientist and thinks of thinks of things that way. He's not a great scientist in terms of how we think about it today, but I feel like you can open up Plato right now and feel right. like, like he is speaking, he is in touch with no, that's the a human great, condition yeah. in a kind of way. He is in we touch. don't say like, well, that doesn't make sense anymore. Right. Now we know. Right. I mean, when you, <laughs> when you think about Plato's tripartite soul, like that is a mirror on the self. Yeah. You know, in a really powerful way. And Augustine is so deeply impacted by Plato. Yeah. Augustine, it's through Plato that Augustine becomes a Christian. So we don't get the monumental Christian theologian Augustine without Plato. Plato plays a hmm. huge role in that. And I just think, again, these, I'm thinking of what are the names that are just going to keep spilling yep. forward in this course. These two are going to for sure. Well, I can't disagree with that. <laughs> so I also have um, Augustine. Up here, why do why do you like Augustine better? It's just I don't what I care. Say. I know yeah. I don't, like I don't have any. I don't. No, I don't. I don't doesn't any, matter. I'm a dog in the we'll fight. We'll call him Augustine. Okay, let's do. So, um, I also have Augustine for all of the reasons that you just mentioned. So there's not a whole lot to say there that you have not already said. So, it's a tough. It's a tough. Um, this is a tough one. Yeah, I they're both. Like. I think they're both. They're both really interesting lists to think about. What do you think of as 
what makes someone significant, right. important. Um, you mean we're looking at the big differences? I think you mean it's the, these two are yeah. Huge it's like for me, it's right? just this. It's this church state question, mm -hmm. yep. and that just I mean because I think again we we've not come to any conclusions on that. We wrestle with that anew mm -hmm. all the time. So for me, that I just was like that. I gotta Absolutely. have that there. Mm -hmm. Now we can have our own opinions about this, Lisa. Sure now can. it's your mm -hmm. turn to have an opinion. So yeah. when you go on to Moodle, we will uh, you'll see these lists on the webisode you're watching right now, and you'll have a chance to vote on which list which makes you the better think, unit one sandwich. Yeah, best <laughs> kind of encapsulates the most significant figures yeah. from the unit. Yes. Well done. Well done indeed. All right, we'll be back with segment three. All right, Sam, we're running out of time. You ready for Happy Happy? I am. Happy birthday to Sufjan Stevens, one of my favorite singer-songwriters, turns 44 today. Sam, at one point, Sufjan Stevens claimed that he was going to do, he called it the States Project. He was going to make an album for each state. But he only got as far as Michigan and then Illinois. And I especially like the Illinois album because one song is called Come On, Feel the Illinois. And he also has songs Yikes. inspired by poet Carl Sandburg and serial killer John Wayne Gacy. Sam, if you were going to ask him to make one more state album, which state album would you like to hear? That's really tough. Like, because the easy answer I want to get out of this question is to just say Minnesota, but I actually think I would be annoyed by a Minnesota album. I also think I would be annoyed by the people who love the fact that he made a Minnesota yeah, album. That's absolutely um, true. So that leads me to want to think, I actually love the, like, the Oregon vibe would be oh. kind of my, that's that would be the album I would like the most. Portlandia, the album. Yeah, that that works. <laughs> that okay. Would be for other reasons, but, uh, but yeah, but but I all I, or I would p pick like a really big state and just think like, well, there's all kinds of influences yeah. there, so you can't go wrong with like California, New York. But there's probably half the albums made are California or New York records. So I will say Oregon. <laughs> and we've already had Nebraska done by Bruce Springsteen because otherwise I'd say it'd be fun to kind of like dig like deeper cuts. In That's right. That we don't think about very much. Like <laughs> Delaware, the album. That's right. Fun. Chris, happy anniversary to the zip code. Code. Uh, introduced by the U.S. Postal Service on this day in 1963. Chris, what was the last actual letter you sent by snail mail? Okay. Now, actual, I don't, there's like one bill I still, maybe two bills I still. We're not pay. counting that. Okay, that doesn't count. Uh, do greeting cards count? No. Oh, okay. The last... well, unless you wrote more than half a page uh, of, of text. I don't like to write okay. a lot. The last, it's funny because I actually used to write a lot of letters. When I was in college, I actually wrote a letter to my parents every single week my first year, which tells you how home. Do you have those still? My Did mom they... does. Ooh, that's a book I want to read. <laughs> that's a primary source that needs to die. So uh, unfortunately, the last letter, I actually, I actually had to resign from something once, and I had to write a real letter and send it to some people. And I even like CC'd people, which wow. the resignation letter is a very odd letter to have to write. So that, that was probably the last actual letter I sent. <laughs> okay, happy eight trails to the month of June. Sam, are you looking forward to July when average high temps in the Twin Cities rise five degrees to 83? No, and here's why, and I think students, you can, you can back me up on this. Like, as long as the date still says June, mm -hmm. I can tell myself, oh, there's tons of summer left. Right. I start to go into like this existential crisis when we go into July, because I start thinking, you know, July, it's great, you know, the semester's not starting yet, but like once we hit August, oh, then that's, that's the month where things really mm -hmm. start. So like I, I kind of dread July only because it's almost August, only because that's almost September. Yeah, I saw something on Bethel's Instagram account saying 75 days the first football game. Don't ever do that. I don't want to know that. <laughs> Why are you doing that to us? But you didn't kind of jump on my climate change question there. Like, do you enjoy hot weather? Because you escaped to northern Wisconsin whenever you Yeah, play. I'm kind of an indoor kid, so yeah. as long as it's, it's air conditioned or I have big fans, I don't mind. <laughs> All right. Well, that was very informative. Hopefully, the rest of that taught you a lot about you. <laughs> Does that surprise you that I'm an indoor guy? <laughs> no, <not> at all. <laughs> Me too. Okay. So you have no discussion post tomorrow. You have no assignment tomorrow except, obviously, to study for the UN one test. Maybe and vote on last, vote last on food device. chain. <laughs> oh, that's right. You can vote on food chain as well, which is not an assignment. That's just joy. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so any last advice for the exam, Sam, before we let them go and head off to study? Uh, manage your time well and allow flash. <laughs> <laughs>